Good morning to everybody. We're happy to welcome you to Cobalt Law Firm webinar dedicated to business relocation from Belarus to Lithuania. My name is Daria Zhok. I'm managing partner at Cobalt Belarus Law Firm. And together with my colleagues from Lithuanian office, Jozas Rimas and Jovita Valatkaite, we are going to have one hour live um, webinar um, and try to cover all the aspects related to uh, relocation process from Belarus to Lithuania. Uh, some organizational issues. We propose the following agenda. Uh, we'll start with um, general uh, overview of business environment in Lithuania. Um, with the most common types of companies, uh, establishment process, management structure, requirements for management bodies, um, establishment and maintain costs. Then we'll continue with transfer of employees and we'll cover uh, main differences between business visas and residence permits, um, uh, highly qualified employees versus uh, low skilled employees. We'll talk about different aspects of getting these uh, permits to, 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 to the team. And then uh, I'll talk about uh, the Belarusian side of relocation. What aspects have to be taken into account before relocate from employment, tax, currency control, and business perspectives? We welcome your questions. Uh, we are ready to receive them uh, either via chat or uh, later on as a follow-up emails or calls. So we're going to have approximately 10-15 uh, minutes for uh, QA session. So uh, we are ready to start and the first speaker will be my colleague Jozas Rimas, partner and the head of the mergers and acquisition practice group at Cobalt Lithuania. Jozas, uh, specializes in the fields of M&A and corporate law. So Jozef, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Um, introduction uh, into what you would uh, be expecting in Lithuania while, while you are exploring the ideas of relocation. This will not be a detailed review uh, by all means, but uh, just to give you the overall uh, flavor of what you could expect. Um, first uh, point, uh, or the general idea is, uh, uh, why Lithuania? So we mm, can see in the in media some discussions uh, whether uh, Lithuania is the best option. There are some other countries uh, that are striving to attract attention of, of Belarusian businesses that are considering relocation to, to neighboring countries. But uh, we're convinced that Lithuania is a very good platform for Belarusian uh, businesses to think of. Um, obviously and naturally, um, there's a question of proximity. So uh, Minsk and Vilnius are really close and uh, jokingly, we sometimes say that uh, uh, and this is uh, geographically true, but uh, just to think of uh, Minsk and, and Belarus itself is closer to, to Vilnius than our, than our uh, seaside resorts. So it's really um, the proximity in geographically and in economical terms should be uh, one of the points, points to note. Uh, another aspect is um, uh, the overall friendliness of Lithuania towards uh, foreign investors. Uh, we have uh, mm, uh, quite flexible uh, processes in place for incorporation and uh, those Belarusian businesses would be willing to relocate to Lithuania, will appreciate the fact that uh, uh, no representatives of the investor will have to come to Lithuania uh, well into the actual process after launch of the operations. So after your local lawyers will receive uh, the power of attorney and some additional documents that are necessary, everything will be taken care of in terms of incorporation uh, locally without any physical presence of, of the investor. Um, that will be a quick process. It is three business days after all uh, documents are in place. In practical terms, it very much depends on the speed uh, uh, demonstrated by the 
by the investor uh, itself. So um, it did practice since uh, a week, two weeks uh, tops. Uh, if if you if you're uh, having a timetable of uh, your relocation operations, so it's uh, not a, a big issue at all. Uh, another point is that there are no residence requirements for CEO for management board members. So you would uh, typically see that uh, uh, the management of uh, of the company of the foreign investor in Lithuania uh, has not uh, uh, come to Lithuania for some time, um, and the business is already running. So we're very much used uh, to these situations in Lithuania. Um, you would expect uh, some uh, general points uh, to note right away. So you would uh, be planning for a minimum share capital of 2,500 uh, euros, very moderate expenses for, for the incorporation. The notary and registry fees will be around 300 euros. So it will not be a major exercise at all. Uh, another point, another general point that uh, uh, the investors, uh, the Russian businesses should uh, take note of is uh, the um, possibility to use the help and attention of uh, the Lithuanian uh, foreign direct investment agency, Invest Lithuania. It is a very um, business oriented organization uh, and they're delivering uh, like a private company in terms of responsiveness and uh, attention despite being a state owned uh, state institution uh, so you if, if the investor if the Belarusian company is planning to hire at least 20 employees uh, in three years after launch locally hired or relocated employees then this is a uh, a project a foreign investment project that invest lithuania is very keen to assist with and um, there are several ways uh, they are assisting, and uh, we are working with Invest Lithuania in parallel, in cooperation, so that the investor is um, assisted in uh, all uh, necessary uh, ways. Uh, so for Invest Lithuania, um, what they can do, they, they will assist uh, the investor with uh, contacts with state authorities, they will streamline processes, they will speed up necessary procedures uh, and they will um, also uh, they will also assist um, with um, uh, they, they will also assist with uh, commercial uh, properties uh, they will uh, assist with HR uh, matters so this is uh, something uh, that uh, every investor should uh, know, uh, take note of. Also, the related uh, aspect is uh, the EU subsidies that are available for uh, foreign investors. And there's a possibility to uh, explore certain programs which would uh, provide some cashback uh, options of up to 20% of sales costs for the first two years. For those investors, as I mentioned, they are uh, planning a quite sizable uh, 20 employees, at least 20 employees during three years with a salary which would be above average. The average uh, gross salary in Lithuania is around 1,400 euros currently. Uh, and that in the investor, the, um, the company which would be uh, eligible for that uh, support is uh, uh, should, should be generating at least 10 million euro revenue globally, not, not in Lithuania, uh, but globally, and should be at least three years in operation. So it uh, shouldn't be a start in the, in the very uh, early stages uh, of the operations. Um, one more point I would like to touch upon uh, where we see uh, uh, the that our um, help uh, might be very relevant, and uh, that is something really to note in practical terms, 
is for the companies uh, to when they are planning a relocation of uh, employees with families, um, probably this that thing might right away, but uh, you will definitely need some uh, assistance with practicalities. Uh, the employees uh, will be looking at some housing options. They will need uh, their belongings to be transported phone, internet, uh, school and kindergarten options for children, um, personal bank account matters, medical services. This is uh, not a legal uh, matter. However, this is very closely related to the process. So you have to take care of everything in that, uh, in that process. Yeah. So uh, when in cooperation with professionals who are um, willing to assist uh, the investors with these practical uh, matters, um, then the process is really streamlined. The lawyers will be taking care of incorporation matters uh, and uh, um, migration matters. However, in parallel, all the practical uh, issues will be taken care of uh, by the specialists who, who are um, very experienced in this practical side of relocation. So this is uh, about it. I would like to make as an introduction, uh, as I touched upon uh, the point of migration uh, and employment matters that have to be taken care of. So I would like to uh, defer to, to my colleague uh, Yovita, our employment and migration specialist, will be discussing in a bit more detail uh, the points that have to be taken into account by the investors in this field. Thanks. So, Yevita, please, the floor is yours. And uh, please um, give us a short, um, uh, short introduction on these migration issues. We all know that Lithuania is now quite active, being more open and friendly to, to Belarusian companies, um, founders, startups who wish to relocate. So, we really have a lot of questions. What are the current migration um, aspects. So please, we are very waiting for your speech. Dario, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I will share my slides uh, very quickly and we can begin. Okay, so yes, I would like to shed some light on migration issues because um, Transfer of employees is one of the key aspects usually in moving the company to another country. So migration issues uh, are quite complicated, but I hope that today we will be able to together to understand them a little bit more. So I will touch upon um, three basic topics, uh, visa and residence permit, what is the difference between them, because people usually mix uh, those two up and don't really understand what the benefits or, of one or the other are. Then if you're relocating highly skilled employees versus low skilled employees, what's the difference in that? And finally, relocation of shareholders and CEO, because that is a little bit of a particular topic. So let's start with visa versus residence permit. When we're talking about visa, uh, in terms of Lithuanian law, it means national D visa or Schengen visa. There is no business visa as such. Basically, uh, visa and permits uh, are uh, two bases on which a person can come into Lithuania and then how they are issued uh, rely on different legal grounds. So both visa D and permits can be issued on the basis of employment of a person being a CEO, shareholder, having family in Lithuania and etc. So just for you to understand, there are no different type of visas. There is no business visa. It's just one visa D and permit, which are both uh, issued on different legal grounds. So uh, just to have the uh, basically the, the language together, because sometimes if you go to a migration department or you call an embassy in Belarus, if you start talking about business visa, 
it's possible that the officials working there will not understand you. So just uh, to have um, uh, all of the aspects clear, visa or permit. Now, actually, what is the difference between a visa B or a permit? Well, um, in terms of duration, visa B can only be issued from 91 days to one year. It cannot be prolonged. And actually, when you receive this long-term visa B, afterwards, you have to convert into residence permit if you don't leave Lithuania. So it's a short-term solution. It's a good solution, but it's short-term. While a residence permit can be issued for up to three years. So if you are a low-skilled employee or you are planning to transfer low-skilled employees, uh, the visa will be, the permit will be issued for two years and for highly skilled employees, it's up to three years. So it's a more long-term solution. And once you have a permit, you can renew it basically on the same legal ground indefinitely uh, provided that your circumstances don't change or that you keep a job in Lithuania. Then uh, one of the key differences as well is uh, the, the term or the period within visa and permit are issued. So visa D is issued within 15 days, very quick, two weeks. If you have your documents together, then it goes really fast. While permit is issued within 15 days, but as well the issuance um, deadline can range from one month, two months, or four months. And those deadlines actually depend on the legal ground. So if you are a highly skilled employee, visa will be, permit will be issued uh, within 15 days. If you are low skilled, then it's one month, two months, and uh, four months. So, um, when you are planning to obtain a residence permit, then you really have to look into the legal ground. The uh, more highly skilled employee you are, or the more Lithuania needs you as a professional, the easier and the faster the permit will be issued. And um, also it relates to salary as well. So if uh, an employee receives a higher salary, then the uh, the procedures go uh, quite fast. If the employee is paid minimum salary or quite low salary, then the procedures are a little bit more burdensome. And that is, uh, this system is set up so that uh, Lithuania attracts more talent uh, into the country. Then also, uh, when it comes to where you should apply for visa D, normally you should apply in Belarus. So you have to have your um, documents ready or the documents of the employees ready, and then contact the Lithuanian embassy in Belarus, submit your documents, and then your visa will be issued. While for permit, uh, you apply in Lithuania. And then we will speak a little bit about how it goes, uh, what the actual sequence of the actions is when you're applying for a permit in Lithuania. Um, as I mentioned, visa D and permit are issued on various legal grounds. So uh, visa D can be issued on the legal ground of employment, of the fact that you are a director or CEO of a company or a shareholder. The same goes for residence permit. Uh, because Visa D is a more short-term solution, if you actually have employment, if you are a CEO or a shareholder, usually it is more recommended to apply for permit because it will be issued most probably for a longer period of time. Um, then uh, can the applicant bring family on a Visa D or a permit basis? Yes, in both cases, and actually for the visas, um, it's a little bit of a change for Belarusian nationals because uh, if a person applies for a visa D on regular circumstances, he cannot bring family. However, Lithuania makes an exception for Belarusian citizens. If they apply on visa D, they can bring family. There is an exception in the law. Uh, when it comes to permit, uh, then usually the applicant can bring family, especially if he is a highly skilled employee. And so that is something to look into, but 
most probably if you are a Belarusian citizen, you will be able to bring your family into Lithuania on the basis of visa D or permit. Now, when it comes to state fee, uh, perhaps you may wonder if permit is much more expensive because it's a more long-term solution. It is not a permit cost, so the state fee is from 120 to 240 uh, euros. Uh, visa, uh, the state fee is uh, 120 euros. So there isn't a big difference. And to summarize both of these options, uh, Visa D is actually a good solution if you want to come to Lithuania quickly, if you need to resolve your issues quickly. So with Invest Lithuania and Enterprise Lithuania, the government uh, institutions that Luas has, has talked about, uh, if an investor is planning relocation together with them, they can actually issue a guarantee letter. And on the basis of this guarantee letter, uh, then the embassy of Lithuania in Belarus will issue visas D. And those visas D usually last for six months and uh, they are issued um, basically on the basis of that guarantee letter issued by one of the institutions. And then the applicants have six months to sort their issues out. So, so to find a job to change into a permit um, so that they have a more permanent status here in Lithuania, to establish a business and so on. So this is a very good way and a very good solution if you need to quick, uh, if you need a very quick relocation, a very quick solution, um, the situation may be changing rapidly, maybe today you're not thinking about it and tomorrow you already need to move. So in that case, this ID is a good solution. As I mentioned, a residence permit is a more long-term solution. So uh, in any case, we recommend if even if you have a visa D to change over to permit um, when you can. Uh, now let's move to a second part of my presentation. So highly skilled employees versus low skilled employees. I have mentioned about them a little bit when talking about residence permit, but let's see what the differences are. So um, highly skilled employee is a person who has a university diploma or five years of, of experience in that field where he is applying. Uh, while low skilled employees should have a school diploma, so a high school diploma um, or some professional vocational school diploma and one year of job experience, just a general job experience. Um, then uh, there should be a perfect match in uh, the education of an employee and the work that he is going to be doing in Lithuania. So how this works is uh, the employer should actually register um, some job places within um, employment service and those job places uh, should, uh, should have some requirements. So some education requirements and some, um, uh, some requirements of work experience, and there should be a perfect match. So for example, if you are um, an engineer of some sorts, you don't have a university diploma, but you have some, let's say vocational um, school diploma and you have one year of experience, and both of them should relate to engineering. Uh, when it comes to highly skilled employees, uh, a decision from employment service is usually not required, but um, still there should be a perfect match. So if uh, you are hiring an IT expert, then that person should have an IT diploma or a um, relevant uh, five-year experience in IT. Um, so for low skilled employees, uh, the residence permit is issued within two to four months. For highly skilled is one month to 15 days. So as I have mentioned, the more highly skilled you are, the faster it goes and the easier the procedures actually are. Um, then the decision from employment service is an additional step that should be done by the employer. And if the employer works with us, we help to go through this procedure, through this step. 
And usually the decision from employment service to employ someone from outside of the Lithuania, outside from the EU is required, except if the employee, low skill employee, uh, enters into a list and each quarter uh, the government of Lithuania publishes a list of uh, the professions that are in high demand in Lithuania. So there is one list for low skilled employees and there is one list for highly skilled employees. And in that list of highly skilled employees, basically half of the list is IT professions. So IT architect, IT engineer and things that I don't really understand, but I'm sure that uh, those who work in IT uh, can see the difference. So um, those lists are actually very handy because they also simplify the procedures for the applicants. So for example, if a person uh, belongs or his profession belongs to a list of low skilled employees who are in high demand in Lithuania, then the decision from employment service is not required and the step can basically be skipped. Uh, for highly skilled employees, if uh, an employee belongs or his profession belongs to that list, then he can be paid a slightly lower salary. Um, so then we're moving to the, another part, salary, because there are some salary requirements when you are employing person from Belarus. So for low skilled employees, it should be at least minimum salary uh, in Lithuania, which currently is 607 euros gross. It's a monthly salary. For highly skilled employees, as I mentioned, the applicant should not only have a university diploma or relevant experience, but also, also should receive a salary of 2,080 uh, euros 50 cents, that is gross, and belong to a list, as, as I have previously mentioned, or should have a high salary, so 4,161 euro, and belong to no list. There's also a middle ground if a person does not belong to a list, but he receives a salary of 2,080 euro. Uh, he can still be issued a, a residence permit in, uh, on, his, uh, on the ground of his high qualification, but it will take longer. So it will take around one month. Uh, now, regarding salary, both low-skilled employees and highly-skilled employees can bring their families together. And again, there is a star next to the family where low-skilled employees are because it's an exception called for Belarusian citizens. Now, the duration of residence permit for low-skilled employees is two years, while for highly-skilled employees is three years. So just to summarize, the process if you are applying for a residence permit here in Lithuania is pretty much like this. First of all, you need to obtain a decision from employment service, which basically certifies that yes, a company can hire employees outside of the Lithuania or outside of the EU. Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes this decision is not required and is usually required only for low-skilled employees. Then um, an application should be submitted via Migri system, which is an online system uh, managed by the migration department. And we can help with that. The applicant does not have to struggle trying to fill in these forms. Um, usually we assist with that uh, on the basis of power of attorney. Then there is one visit to migration department. So as soon as the application is submitted, a person is assigned a, a date or he can choose a date within four month period. So basically he has to come and uh, visit the migration department, have a face-to-face -face visit, but he can choose uh, the most suitable date. Um, so there should be a visit to migration department. The person should bring documents that he has submitted in his online application. So for example, if it's a highly skilled employee, he should bring a, his university diploma. He should bring some other documents along um, that were submitted with application. Um, during this visit, also photo and fingerprints of this person is taken, so his biometrics, 
And on the basis of um, this, these biometrics, a permit is issued within 15 days. And then the person only needs to come for a second time to retrieve his permit. The card is already uh, made. So it's a plastic card, uh, which has, um, which basically is a key gateway or a key to many institutions here in Lithuania. The person is assigned a personal code uh, and then he can start uh, working, living here in Lithuania. So basically it's a short overview of the process and we usually assist along this process. So we help to obtain a decision from employment service. We help to prepare and submit the application. We go together with the applicants to the migration department and we uh, explain the officials there what the situation is and so on. If there are some uh, things that were not filled in correctly or if there are some misunderstandings, we help um, within that meeting to straighten any things that may have happened. So, but however, for Belarusian citizens, I think it, it's quite an easy process because usually in migration department, everyone speaks Russian so they can even interact face to face. Regardless of that, um, we assist with the visit. So the last part of my presentation would be relocation of shareholders and CEO. And why it's different uh, than relocation of highly skilled employees low skilled employees and so on, because there are some very, very specific requirements if um, a CEO or a shareholder wants to obtain a residence permit or a visa here in Lithuania. So uh, first of all, uh, the company should have 28,000 euro equity capital. At least half um, of this money should be invested by the shareholder if we are talking about a person who is obtaining residence permit or a visa um, on this legal ground. Now, equity capital is not the same as share capital. Equity capital is basically all um, the assets that the company has at the, and that are included in the balance sheet of the company. Um, so share capital of the company can be lower, as you as mentioned, 2,500 euros, but then in the and balance sheet of the company, some other assets should be featured, either money or it can be some material assets or some intangible assets. The company should also draw up a business plan and should perform business activity for at least six months prior to CEO or a shareholder applying for his residence permit. And then the last uh, point is that the company should have EU or Lithuanian employees or permanent residents employed in that company and they should work full time. And it's not specified how many of these employees should be in the company, but together they should gain at least 2,080 euros and as their gross salary. Um, so basically, there aren't any exceptions from these requirements. However, if you are a CEO or a shareholder, first of all, you can access this uh, national visa D, which is issued on a guarantee of Invest Lithuania or Enterprise Lithuania. And then after you come in Lithuania on the basis of this visa D, um, you can basically establish your company and you can... Uh, start the company running so that when it, the, it's a time for you to convert your residence permit, you match these requirements. Um, and then um, once the residence permit is issued for you, there are some conditions. So the permit is issued within two to four months. The duration of the permit is two years. There is a possibility, of course, to bring families. So if you have dependents, uh, they don't have to apply for um, a special legal ground. They can apply for a legal ground because you are shareholder or CEO and no decision from employment service is required. Um, so basically, in short, these are the conditions if you are a shareholder and CEO. 
And with that, I finished my presentation. If you have any questions, if something was not really clear to you, because I understand migration is a tough topic to cover and um, it's quite confusing sometimes, please do not hesitate to contact us. You can see the email below. It's Vilnius at cobalt.legal. Please provide any of your questions that you have and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you, Jovita. Thank you, Jozas. And before we take the questions uh, right away, I'll like to cover uh, some aspects from the Belarusian perspectives. Uh, we were advising on relocation projects, not only today due to political context, but many, many times before. And uh, I would say that maybe first that we should think about its business aspects of relocation we should consider uh, which business functions and operations we'd like to relocate and which to live in Belarus. If we do not speak about the, the full, the complete relocation, then which functions particularly we would like to relocate, production, R&D, sales, business development. Usually uh, clients were choosing, for instance, to relocate uh, such functions as business development, sales, marketing, um, to EU mother company and to leave, for instance, production and R&D functions in Belarus, especially if we talk about high-tech uh, companies, IT companies being um, members of high-tech park. Um, and following uh, this high-tech park residency, I also would like to recall you uh, about the compliance with high-tech park requirements and business models that you were declared while entering the high-tech park. If you're going to relocate your R&D functions, uh, then most probably you won't be eligible anymore for being a resident of High Tech Park. And you would not be uh, able to prove uh, that you are doing your activities that were approved in business models. So this is also what you need to consider while relocate fully or not fully to, to Lithuania or to another uh, EU uh, jurisdiction. Uh, tax residency from corporate and personal perspective. This is also quite important issue. I'd like to recall you about the general rule of 183 days. Uh, so if you are staying more than 183 days in the calendar year at the particular jurisdiction, so you would be most probably considered as tax resident of this country. Uh, then uh, currency control, uh, issues from Belarusian perspective. Here I'm talking about national bank permits for physical persons uh, for so-called capital flow transactions. Namely, these transactions uh, involve uh, opening a company abroad, investing into the share capital of this company, granting loan to foreign borrower, even including your own company that was established by you. So these transactions from national bank perspective, as of now, they still require uh, permits. Uh, since uh, next year, since summer next year, 2021, these permits most probably will be abolished. At least there is a, a law that has been already approved. Um, but uh, if we speak about today, reality, so these permits are required. Our last um, experience was in, in July. We, uh, we got uh, two permits for our clients. Uh, we, didn't, we did not have any problems at all. I don't know what is, uh, what is the approach, current approach of National Bank today. Um, if we speak about the uh, liability of not getting these permits, uh, then uh, it's an uh, administrative fine uh, in the amount of from 50 till 100 basic units. So basically it's around, it might be around 1,000 US dollars for not getting this permit. Uh, the other aspect that we also have to consider while relocate is how you will finance your uh, company, your foreign company. Uh, via loans, via intra-group transactions, we are share, share capital investments. And um, all these uh, transactions, they would also require thorough considerations from uh, transfer pricing perspectives. So for instance, if you are doing intra-group contracts, then uh, the prices 
have to be more or less at the market level. So, and, and we know that our tax authorities are getting more and more strict uh, from, from, uh, from, from that uh, transfer pricing perspective. It's not only the Russian uh, tax authorities, it's also Lithuanian and European. So this is a common approach that intergroup transactions, loans, contracts, and so, so on and so forth. They are at a special, more thorough control from the tax authorities as of now. And maybe the last but not the least aspect that I would like you to remember while relocating is management of your local, personal and corporate assets. So what basic you leave in Belarus? Company, business, assets, your current accounts. So this is also what you really have to think about. Um, how your company, your local company will be managed if you're gonna be moving to, to, to another uh, company. Uh, to another uh, country, um, and and so on and so forth. So these things have also be analyzed, and and you have to be prepared. So um, we have some time for the questions, and uh, so Yevita uh, I, I I'd like to address several questions that I got uh, as of now. For instance, um, one migration aspect, can I leave Lithuania after obtaining a residence permit or visa? Can I leave Lithuania or should I stay there permanently? Uh, <laughs> yes, of course, a person can leave Lithuania when he or she obtains a visa or residence permit, but uh, the general rule is that you should still stay in Lithuania for more than half of your time. So usually it's calculated on the basis of six months. So within each period of six months, you should stay in Lithuania three months plus one day. So of course you can go back to Belarus, you can travel to other EU or non-EU countries. Basically the permit or visa received in Lithuania allows you to travel all over Schengen area, but you should not uh, relocate somewhere else permanently. What happens if you uh, overstay in another country is the migration department can revoke your um, permit because um, they have a possibility to track if, especially if you're crossing the border uh, outside of the EU, um, they have the possibility to calculate how many days uh, you have been away. So if you uh, overstay in another country, they can basically revoke your permit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another question I also guess uh, for you, can I be a CEO and shareholder and highly skilled employee at the same time? Right, so that's an excellent question um, because sometimes uh, this, the, the rules are a little bit more simple for highly skilled employees. And uh, of course, uh, one would like to be a CEO and a highly skilled employee or a CEO and a shareholder and highly skilled employee at the same time in order to benefit from the long-term residence permit and a very fast process that, uh, that it can provide. However, if you are a CEO or a shareholder and at the same time you are a highly skilled employee, being a CEO and shareholder overrules uh, the fact that you are also a highly skilled employee. So still, even if you have one share in the company, 1% of shares, you have to apply as shareholder. So for that reason, you have to take into consideration um, how the, your company will be structured and whether you actually want to be a CEO of the company. Perhaps you want to um, However, perhaps this issue is not even so important for you. Um, and uh, it's not um, something that is, uh, let's say, a total dead end if you are a CEO or shareholder. It's just something that you have to plan in advance to meet the requirements that um, are in the law. And by the way, Yevita, uh, if I got you right, uh, highly skilled employee status, it's not only for uh, IT guys, right? It's not necessarily uh, tech education. It could be any high uh, education. 
like uh, finance, uh, law, management, business, whatever. Uh, yes, that's correct. So it doesn't matter if uh, you have a university diploma in something else, you are still considered a highly skilled employee. The benefit if you are an engineer, if you work in IT, if you have more of a technical background, uh, that you may fall into that list that I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier. So mm -hmm. that list basically simplifies uh, the procedures even, even more. Um, so if you have a university diploma from those areas, it's a benefit. Uh, if you have a university diploma from a different area, it's not a showstopper. You can still apply for um, as if you are a highly skilled employee. Um, it's just, uh, it may take a little bit more time or maybe you have to go through an additional procedure. But then again, you can benefit from, from the long-term stay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I guess you have already mentioned uh, something about uh, the assets and share capital of the company, uh, but uh, I also got a question, can share capital of a company be covered in assets instead of money? Um, maybe just more, more clear answer. <laughs> Yes, uh, so I'll probably take, take that question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, in principle, this is a, an option under Lithuanian law. You can yeah, use also non monetary uh, contribution to pay up uh, their share capital. Frankly, it is used quite seldom. This is not the usual way of incorporation, and uh, um, especially in the context of relocation, this might be rarely. Uh, looked at by, by the prospective in investor. However, uh, should there be a need uh, to use some non-monetary um, assets, some fund, uh, some um, uh, contribution other than uh, cash, it may be done. However, there are some additional requirements regarding valuation of those assets. So it uh, will not make the process extremely complicated, but it will add some time and expense. Uh, therefore, I think for location processes, uh, the speed, of, the speed is of, of essence, and there are many other practical uh, issues to be taken care of. So usually recommend for, for the relocating businesses to set up the operations with a minimum share of capital first, and then, uh, uh, yeah, addressing um, equity as necessary um, for migration purposes, but um, the incorporation and share capital uh, should be addressed as in as simple terms as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, also one more very, very common question that we got, is it difficult to open a bank account? Because there are so many rumors that now European banks are quite reluctant, quite strict with these QIC, IMN procedures. So the question is very simple. Is it difficult to open a bank account for a Lithuanian company which is uh, registered uh, by Belarusians, either legal entity or physical persons? Yeah, so it's indeed a very topical question. Um, uh, for this purpose, I would... Uh, you distinguish two types of accounts. Uh, first, uh, for the purpose of incorporation itself, and for accumulation of the shared capital, the so-called accumulative bank account is uh, opened quite easily in Lithuania, despite uh, the overall um, atmosphere of, of uh, carefulness by, by the banks. However, in practical terms, it is opened in one business day. This is this is fact. So. For, for the starters, you can, you can move on quite, um, quite easily. Uh, however, uh, the time comes then for conversion of that cumulative bank account into a current bank account, which would be used for payments. And here the KYC uh, procedures are indeed uh, uh, in place and, and uh, are quite strictly looked at by the financial institutions. However, here I would again split uh, um, financial institutions into three groups uh, and this must be taken into account by the investors and therefore some professional assistance might be necessary to sort it out. So the first group is Scandinavian banks, 
SCP, Swed Bank, Lumiar. Uh, so uh, this is the category of banks who are quite, uh, they are large organizations. They have quite a lot of processes uh, going on and a lot of clients. Therefore, you would indeed ex uh, might expect some delay in, in processing of those requests and very strict uh, KYC approach. The second uh, category uh, is special, uh, uh, is um, the so-called private banks or we say non-Scandinavian banks such as Citadelle or uh, smaller uh, and um, perhaps more uh, dynamic, more attentive to requests from potential clients. We have seen uh, more responsiveness from them and um, somewhat shorter procedures in, in con converting the account. Uh, and the third category is the special purpose banks. Uh, Lithuania is very well known for its uh, uh, fintech orientation and uh, number of licenses issued to fintech uh, companies. Some of them having uh, the special purpose bank license, which uh, is suitable for setting up of current bank accounts. And this category of uh, financial institutions is uh, um, even more flexible than the second category. And this is uh, uh, the financial institutions that, are, that we are turning to more and more in, in our projects with our clients uh, wishing to relocate to incorporate in Lithuania. Yes, there you would expect, uh, uh, they, they are prudent, they, they are doing the necessary KYC procedures. However, this is done in a much more streamlined manner um, and the process will uh, not take um, excessive time. You, you would simply see the uh, interaction with the uh, bank manager um, uh, moving on much more fluently than we would uh, expect from other financial institutions. Uh, so, to answer your question in general terms, yes, this is still uh, a thing to consider. This is still an issue in Lithuania. However, with the increasing competition of market players, financial institutions in Lithuania, and the possibility to, um, to file applications to special purpose banks, uh, we, can, we can work with incorporation projects uh, in a much more uh, prompt manner. Uh, the legislator is also taking some steps. Uh, there's ongoing process of uh, changing the company law in Lithuania to allow uh, opening of these cumulative accounts in payment institutions in yet another uh, category of fintech companies, uh, a, a large number of them, so it would further increase competition uh, between the uh, players in the financial services. A market in Lithuania and would, and would make even more easier um, for, for uh, investors to incorporate. But this is still in the process. So we have these practical solutions and uh, for our clients, the special purpose bank way is, is quite uh, uh, useful and, and um, successful in converting the bank account. Thank you. Uh, due to COVID, uh, you know, COVID reality, we have so many uh, constraints for traveling and also very common questions that we got is whether I, how, how much uh, time should I come before my company will be operational? So shall I come to register the company or you can do it uh, online or via power of attorney? And so maybe could you please comment just from a very like, practical perspective uh, to, to open a company and to open a bank account, to employ uh, the team there, uh, the shareholders, the CEO or the management team, should they somehow enter the Lithuania or it could all be done online or through representations? Yes. So indeed, as I mentioned, in, in general, Lithuania is quite um, flexible in this, in this regard. So indeed, I would say almost all projects that we have with foreign investors uh, starting with incorporation are done remotely, meaning that uh, we receive a power of attorney from the country where the management of the uh, 
founding entity is located. It's not necessarily in Belarus, actually. It's quite, quite often uh, in a Western European countries, sometimes in the US even. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you can uh, authorize a local representative to take care of all procedures necessary for incorporation, including opening of the accumulative bank account. So um, I would say that Mm, in, in Lithuania, you would uh, quite often see uh, uh, that the CEO has never come to Lithuania even. This is not necessarily the ultimate goal, of course, of any business, but for the time being, until it is really necessary, uh, the CEO can operate um, remotely. So, uh, indeed, uh, some day-to-day -day matters uh, can be done by way of power of attorney, and uh, the physical presence of CEO or management board is, is not necessary in Lithuania. However, the time comes perhaps eventually when this is necessary for business purposes. And then uh, this is a, a different question related to migration, sure. employment, law issues. Uh, yes. Yeah. I can touch upon a little bit about employment and migration. So uh, most of the government institutions here operate online. So if you want to employ people, you start up, you establish your company and you want immediately to employ someone, even a Lithuanian or a Belarusian citizen, doesn't really matter. Um, you file all the forms and applications online. So I have mentioned that uh, Residence permit is your gateway to all institutions, and that is because you obtain a Lithuanian personal code. It is assigned to you, and with this code, then you can access online uh, the majority of the institutions, and you can file your applications online. With migration, uh, as I mentioned, if you obtain a, a visa, so a national visa D, you don't have to come to Lithuania. First of all, you obtain the visa and then with visa, you can come to Lithuania. With a residence permit, you have to come to Lithuania once prior to receiving your residence permit. But as I mentioned, we uh, recommend combining the visa with permits. So ideally, you have six months um, under your visa to um, go through all migration procedures with a permit. So you are in Lithuania and then that visit is not an issue, basically. So um, ideally, you can establish your business and have your migration papers ready while you're still in Belarus and you have never come to Lithuania. And uh, as mentioned, some things we can do. So as, as for filing the applications and so on. Um, so uh, you don't have to be physically here. Thank you. We have one minute left. And again, hot question uh, regarding the language. Uh, well, what I've heard from, from the clients, those who already have their companies in Lithuania, they said that sometimes it's quite difficult uh, not knowing the Lithuanian because the business uh, communication, the official communication, it's uh, it's in Lithuanian language, and you really need some local staff beside the company to you know to support all the streams. Uh, so my question is 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 that from business perspective and from um, I don't know person and, and lifestyle. So shall we? If we know Russian, if we are not very fluent with English, so will we be comfortable? Uh, living in, in living and doing business in Vilnius. Well, I think uh, from the business perspective, when interacting with uh, potential local employees, uh, the foreign investors would see that uh, almost all of those employees will speak uh, quite good English, and employees over thirty to thirty-five would very often speak Russian. This is, this is the case still. Um, so, but it is true that um, in, when interacting with state authorities, for instance, it would not be uh, easy to communicate uh, in English, for instance, in all cases. It, it might be the case in, you know, sometimes, but um, usually it's, it's 
the Lithuanian, Russian, you could expect, as I mentioned from uh, senior employees and state authorities, they might switch to Russian as well. So from our clients' uh, experience, we have, we have seen them uh, moving around quite comfor comfortably still using Russian. Uh, but in, in, nevertheless, I think for, for a coherent and, and professional approach to all those issues that we have um, discussed, uh, interaction with the banks, for instance, uh, and the migration authorities, uh, indeed, um, local advisors is, is something um, quite convenient, uh, not only from the legal perspective in terms of legal advice or tax advice, but also from the a language uh, perspective, assisting in that regard as well. Uh, yes, if I can add a little bit, usually when clients establish companies here in Lithuania, we advise to have them at least an accountant company, accounting company, which will take uh, uh, over the day-to-day -day interactions because the most interactions you will probably have with uh, are with state uh, tax inspectorate and the social security insurance board so you may expect some messages from them you have to from time to time file um, some applications or some declarations so regarding how much tax was calculated and paid and so on there are some monthly declarations that should be provided if a company has employees. So usually an accounting company will cover those uh, most important day-to-day -day interactions. For that reason, it's quite convenient to have a local accounting company um, involved in the company's activities and uh, assisting with those matters. And then if it's a more complex issue that you may address or you, that may, you may have, you can always contact us. And basically, because we cover all the aspects and all the areas of law, uh, not only M&A and migration, but also real estate and uh, in corporate matters and so on. Uh, usually we have a professional that can assist with um, any interaction that relates to government institutions or state institutions. So we have seen from our experience that uh, the investors from Russia, Belarus, even China can get by pretty well in Lithuania without knowing Lithuanian. Thank you. Thank you, Evita. Thank you, Yozas. By the way, I miss you guys. It's been like nine months. We have never seen each other in person, but only through Zooms and Teams. So it was a pleasure, uh, you know, talking to you, discussing. Thank you for your insights, for the very valuable information. And thanks to all our audience. Um, we are very happy uh, being with you and uh, so please feel free to contact us um, in Vilnius, in Minsk, uh, via emails or calls and we're gonna lead you through all this relocation process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.